Um, I'm very pleased to be here, but I have to admit to being very daunted because I'm certainly not a tax expert. I'm not a technical expert in any way. I'm an investigative journalist and uh, completely ignorant compared to the expertise in this room. Uh, but I think what we do have a role as investigative journalists in doing is actually changing the political and social climate and asking why it's become so acceptable to tax dodge and to encourage citizens in various countries to get more outraged and with luck influence. Uh, corporates in that way and that's what we've been trying to do on the Guardian it's often very tough work because uh, it's very hard to make it intelligible to lay readers uh, and because of the libel laws particularly in the UK uh, it's extremely common to be threatened with uh, legal action and we have been sued in the past and treated with extreme aggression before publication that's the context in which it becomes difficult to change the climate but my interest uh, in it started when I was actually in the Amazon investigating deforestation and exports of soya and how they were linked uh, and looking at uh, the biggest uh, trading company, uh, Cargill, which is the, one of the largest private companies in the world, in many years is the largest private companies in the world, uh, and is very dominant in uh, the global agricultural commodity trade. Uh, and I was trying to prove that... Uh, Soya from the deforested Amazon was ending up straight on consumers' plates in Europe uh, through animal feed delivered to Britain. Uh, and somebody very kindly stole some shipping notes for me so that I could see what the trail was. Uh, and to my great puzzlement, uh, I noticed that all the Cargill exports from the Amazon, which was hundreds of thousands of tonnes of soya, uh, which went straight by ship to Liverpool or Amsterdam, were actually being routed through uh, a P.O. box at Temple Financial Centre on the tiny island of Provo in the Turks and Caicos. Um, I had absolutely no idea at that point why the largest grain trader in the world would want to route its uh, huge trade through that particular Caribbean island, uh, which is uh, a backwater known mostly for its corruption. Uh, and it's so corrupt that at the moment it's currently under direct rule from uh, the UK while it's being investigated. Uh, so I did what journalists do, which is ring John Christensen and say, what on earth does this mean? Uh, and I will talk a little bit later about uh, what, what I've since discovered about the grain trade and how they route uh, their exports. Um, but it started us off on a trail which uh, led us through some pretty tricky waters at the Guardian. We were sued for some of what we'd written. Uh, and we had to become, as a result, even more expert. Uh, and we, in 2009, ran a huge series on almost unprecedented scale in the paper, where, which was about 60 articles day after day after day over three weeks. Uh, and they're all collected on the Guardian website if anyone wants to look at them. Uh, and if you just Google Guardian Tax Gap, you'll, you'll find the homepage for it all. Um, but I started uh, with trying to find some way of connecting with ordinary people. Uh, and food is a very obvious way to do that. Everybody has some kind of emotional investment in food. Most people hate the idea of tax. They kind of sympathize at some level with corporates dodging it. Uh, so I wanted to try and explain what it, what it was that was being robbed from them. Uh, and bananas were the best example that we could find. Uh, partly because the British have an obsession with bananas. We eat huge numbers of them, and they're actually the largest uh, single item sold in uh, British supermarkets by volume. But they're also subject to great price wars, uh, and uh, they're dominated, the trade is dominated by uh, three TNCs, Dole, Chiquita, and Fresh Del Monte, who have more than two-thirds of the global market between them and they source mainly in large industrial plantations in Latin America and West Africa. But crucially, they also have SEC filings, which meant that we were able to look at their accounts in a much more detailed way than we would be able to if they were in other countries. And I picked up also that they constantly complain that because of the price wars, uh, that they, it was a really difficult business to be in bananas. It was an absolute bum steer. You know, it was so hard to make any money out of it. And I thought, this is very odd. Usually if that's true and all these big corporates aren't making money, you'd expect a few senior executives to be losing their jobs, but they seem to be collecting quite large bonuses. Um, so with a colleague who is trained as a forensic auditor, uh, I looked at uh, their accounts over five years. We, we put together some figures from that. And in the five years to 2007, uh, they had combined global sales of over $50 billion, and they made $1.4 billion of profits between them. Yet they were paying just $200 million in taxes, which was a rate of about 14%. And in some years, the corporations were actually achieving effective tax rates as low as 8%. 
Um, and yet they're, caught, they're all head, headquartered in America, so they should have been around about 30%. Uh, so then we used various anonymous sources, which is of course something that, uh, that newspapers can do and uh, tax inspectors can't do in quite the same way. Uh, I devised a sort of graphic to try and explain to ordinary readers where all the money was going. Uh, and a lot of the sort of uh, theory behind this is, is of course completely familiar to you uh, as experts. But I was trying to explain if you, if you take a pound that you're spending, or a dollar, say, that you're spending in the shops in the UK, uh, where, where does that money go? This is an example we put together, which is a composite. It's, it's roughly the right figures, and it's the right sort of tax havens based on the information that we had about tropical fruit trade. Uh, and typically, for every pound that you're spending in the shops, the producing country is getting about 13p. And if you looked at the corporate accounts and at various uh, union uh, investigations, the labor costs are only 1.5p of that. And I think it's really crucial. The, the idea that they're creating great jobs and uh, leaving lots behind for employment is, is quite interesting when the wages are so low. The cost of production might be around 10.5p in a pound. And they would be exporting at about 13p. So they're only leaving about 1p in taxable profit per pound in the developing country whose resources, whose labour, whose land, whose water they're using. And then typically on paper, uh, although the products were going to be shipped direct to the consuming countries, they'll, they'll start this audit, this trail of uh, invoicing. And in a tax haven like the Cayman Islands with 0% corporation tax, they might be adding about 8p because the subsidiary is charging the parent company for the use of its purchasing network or its expertise there. And then on to Luxembourg on paper, typically lots of treasury companies set up there and lots of subsidiaries taking advantage of the zero rate of tax for holding companies, making loans and uh, operational finances, uh, adding yet another charge to the parent company, 8P. Some of the brands, uh, Fife's, for example, was held in Ireland. The brands are obviously different tax havens favoured for that, but Ireland, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and they might be adding another 4p there. So, so now the price of this piece of fruit that's actually on a ship direct to Europe is sort of but still floating around these tax havens has gone up to 33p. The insurance might be charged from the Isle of Man, another very handy tax haven, add another 4p to the cost executive expertise, management expertise, or perhaps actually just the payments. I've seen several cases where there's been subsidiaries in Jersey which look very much like the, the vehicles for paying executives tax-free bonuses. So you can add another 6p there. And at some point, they, d they do have to pay for the cost of shipping uh, and the whole expertise that goes with, uh, with that, but that also often is in a tax haven. Typically, another 17p might be added somewhere like Bermuda. So now you've got this product's finally arrived, and it's cost 60p to the parent company. All those service charges have been added. It left the originating country at 13p. And then they might sell it to the big retailer at about 61p. So they appear only to be making 1p profit onshore in the consuming country where they have the bulk of their sales. They do actually also frequently sell it for a loss if there's a price war going on. And then they might collect a tax credit. And the retailer typically adds 39 to 40p uh, in retail margin. You can see from, from that graphic why it would be possible for them to say we don't make much money out of this. They don't make much money in the developing country and they don't make much money in the consuming country and don't pay much tax either end. Uh, and if you look, relate that back as we did in the pieces on the Guardian website to the specific companies. Uh, for example, Fresh Del Monte had half its sales in the US in 2005, but it managed to lose $35 million in the States. It did make a very large profit that year overseas, but it paid no US tax, and in fact was given an eight million pound US tax credit. Uh, then we traced where all these uh, companies were registered. Fresh Del Monte is registered in the Cayman Islands, uh, and it has more than 30 subsidiaries there. Uh, it also has subsidiaries in the tax havens of Gibraltar, Bermuda, Dutch Antilles, British Virgin Islands, uh, and incidentally, its tax payments for those years were being challenged by tax authorities in Brazil, Guatemala, Costa Rica, the UK, the US, Italy, Japan, South Africa, South Korea, and that was just 2007, by the way. Uh, and their response to us was, this is all legal. Um, but the, it was a pretty similar story with the, with the other... Uh, the other traders. Um, and one of the 
things that I've been very keen to do is talk about uh, this climate in which it's acceptable to dodge tax like that as half of a flight of corporate responsibility. We've got the flight of capital, but you've also got the flight of the other sort of responsibility where until relatively recently, corporations would feel that they had responsibilities as employers. Uh, and what's happened with the, the tax dodging is in parallel, you've seen this tremendous driving down of conditions and wages uh, in developing countries. Uh, and to give you just one example of that, uh, through that period when we were investigating Del Monte, uh, they, in 1999, they actually sacked 4,300 workers on their main banana plantation in Costa Rica. Uh, and they re-employed them all immediately afterwards on reduced wages with fewer benefits. And then having established that model of cutting costs in Costa Rica, they rolled that out elsewhere. You can see the same pattern in other tropical fruits that they trade in. I looked also at the pineapple trade, uh, and a very similar picture emerging there. And what I want to do is sort of make this plea to make those links, so not just to be talking about what for consumers is a very difficult technical subject of tax avoidance, but to see that as part of this end of a sort of post-war consensus where the, the role of the corporation in society was recognised, uh, where you used to talk to tax directors who, who would know that tax was a contribution back to the society in which you make your money, but also that those employers had obligations, whether it be pensions, health, uh, benefits uh, for workers, um, uh, and that they owed those to the workers who were actually the key to the productivity that created their wealth. Uh, instead of which now we've got all those obligations being thrown back onto the state, but at precisely the moment when they're saying that the state's not going to get any tax to pay for them. Uh, and I think that way lies political conflict. Thanks very much. Thank you.